just like how it was with magic. Sword styles are yet another detailed concept that determines one's strength in the world of Mushoku Tensei. If you wanted to be the ultimate warrior, then your best bet was to knock on the doors of each school and train until you were dead. That's just how much these individual sword styles had to offer. What makes each completely different from the other, though, is their unique basis on fundamentally different philosophical approaches. Each is distinct enough to justify their existence, developed enough to seem believable, but not too complicated as to make you wonder how or why something was possible. It's honestly a genius approach to close quarters combat that goes beyond anything I'd expect from a fantasy series. So let's take a closer look at what each of these three great styles provide in the ways of combat. But before we get started, I'm super excited to share that today's sponsor is the new upcoming Bandai Namco Entertainment mobile game Tales of Luminaria. As a longtime fan of both the Tales games and their anime, I was extremely hyped to find out that this was going to be the next installment in their franchise. So when they reached out to ask if I wanted to promote it, I really didn't have to think hard since part of the benefits was getting to play the game early. That being the case, let me be the first to tell you that this game really does go above and beyond my expectations. Aside from the intuitive gameplay and faithful anime-style graphics, what made my playthrough so enjoyable was its unique approach to the story. They really went out of their way to structure each mission like an episode from an anime. I mean, not only does each of the 21 playable characters have their own episodic missions, but each mission also comes with its own opening and ending song, and even has its own built-in forum for a post-episode discussion. So, what Tales of Luminaria brings is a massive legend that converges across the stories of 21 different protagonists, each of which bring with them a unique environment that coincides with their story, as well as a whole new set of gameplay mechanics different from all the others. Like, Alexandra is more of your classic hack-and-slash frontline warrior, whereas Celia can use a cover mechanic to snipe enemies from a distance. You can also customize their outfits or weapons via items unlocked from the in-game gacha system. So, with that just barely scratching the surface, I highly recommend using the link in the description to pre-register for Tales of Luminaria today. I'm confident it's going to be another great installment into the franchise. But now, let's get back to the video. In order to fully understand each of the sword styles and their unique approaches to battle, we first need to cover the two core mechanics that constitute their existence. The first is a self-buffing ability known as Toki or Battle Aura, and the other is the performance of superhuman feats known as Techniques. While both will likely be explored later on in the anime, they're actually things that we've seen numerous times already. So, as I explain what each of these concepts do in relation to the sword styles, I'll be sure to use spoiler-free examples from the anime to paint a better picture for you. Starting things off with Toki, this is what's essentially a person's battle aura. It's a type of mana manipulation typically used by swordsmen that works to drastically improve their own body's physical capabilities. Whether it be strength, stamina, or speed, pretty much every physical aspect of their body is enhanced to unnatural extremes. As for the way it works, well, it's kind of like applying a coat of energy over yourself. The user who's trying to enhance their own physical performance must first channel their inner mana then manipulate it in a way that can be spread over their body essentially turning their mana into this layer of energy that applies enhancements to whatever part of the body it's covering. Of the enhancements we've seen it apply, strength is of course a given. There's also notable improvements to the basic areas of stamina, speed, and agility, as well as faster reflexes and stronger defenses. So, not only does Toki improve the body's core physical aspects, but it also refines it in a way to match that. Reaction speed to any situation becomes quicker, and the improved defenses give increased resistances to kinetic damage. Now, I'm not sure if it works to resist the damage from energy attacks, but it is very possible Orsted used it here to resist the fire. It could also just be a completely different technique entirely. The novel doesn't really tell us anything. In any case, the last notable thing that Toki does is strengthen gear. In addition to the user's own body, they can also apply this mana-based field of energy to other things the most common of which is the weapon they're holding. So, when we saw Paul slice a boulder in half with nothing but his sword, that was actually him applying Toki to his blade to make it possible. That being the case, it would also make sense then that Toki could be applied to the user's armor, thus improving their clothing's defenses without the need for anything extremely bulky. It's also probably why we don't see any swordsmen wear armor like how a knight would. Now, some more examples of Toki in action can mainly be found during the battle scenes in the forest. You see, Eris jumping from tree to tree and Rijard stopping the snake without even budging are all examples of what Toki is capable of. They're all feats of extraordinary power that go well beyond a human's biological limits. Moving on to techniques now. This is a concept that's a bit more vague. 
there's no clear definition on what they are, but we can surmise that it's a superhuman feat made possible through a combination of skill and magic. It's a very specific type of ability that can only be learned through persistent training and continuous exercise. Going back to the example with the boulder, in addition to Toki being what made it possible, a technique was what was used to enact it. Paul had subconsciously woven magic into the swing and metal of his sword, and as a result produced a technique that could slice a boulder in half. Other techniques range from something as subtle as the kidnapper throwing his sword, all the way to Ghislaine's extravagant ultimate called the Long Sword of Light. There's even techniques for confusing enemies or sharpening the senses. So there's quite a bit of range pertaining to what these techniques are capable of. Not all of them necessarily require magic, but what is common between them is the fact that each require an immense amount of skill and training to master. Just like how magic requires repetitive practice with an incantation, so too do techniques require consistent training and exercise with whatever aspect of the body is needed. So, this could be something as basic as the user's physical prowess, but also require a high intellect or a refined perception. The components really just depend on what the technique is. Now that you know what Toki and techniques are, we can finally move on to the three styles of swordsmanship that make up Mushoku Tensei's combat, the core of its martial arts that distinguish one swordsman from another. Starting off with its origins, each of the three sword styles are named after their founders, a trio of swordsmen who developed the styles while conquering a massive 100 layer labyrinth. Of course, their names weren't water, north, or sword, but to call them gods of those specific aspects was pretty much their epithet. So it only made sense for the resulting styles of swordsmanship to be called Sword God, Water God, and North God. As for the philosophies they're based on, well, it's actually very simple. Sword is focused on offense, water on defense, and the North specializes in adaptability. While each are fundamentally different from the other, they also provide an interesting rock-paper-scissors dynamic between them. You see, where the sword style's aggressive nature has the advantage over the North, that also makes it weak against the defensive nature of the water style. Then, the reason why water has troubles defending against the north is mainly due to its non-standard approach to attacking. That said, this dynamic isn't the end-all be-all when it comes to winning a fight. It's more so a useful reference that takes into account each style's specialized techniques and how they'd fare when used against a different style. The actual outcome of a fight is heavily determined by the fighters themselves. So, even if someone was a rank above in terms of skill, that didn't necessarily mean they'd always win a fight against people lower than them. The levels of beginner and intermediate, all the way to king, emperor, and god, are simply just references that help to dictate what a person could be capable of. There's numerous other factors that can come into play in a real battle. Things that could easily shift the tide in favor of, let's say, a sword saint against a water king. In any case, progressing through the ranks in the sword styles remains a relatively simple process until you get to the advanced level. It's once you get there, though, that a more specialized type of training is needed, one that requires you to learn the sword style's signature technique. Only after displaying a clear proficiency with this saint-level technique is it even possible to be considered to move up into the saint rank or higher. So it's kind of like a gatekeeping mechanic similar to Rudy's test with Roxy. By showing you're capable of this one specific technique, not only are you displaying a solid understanding of the style's fundamentals and philosophy, but you're also showing considerable control over Toki. That's why despite Paul showing skills that are very clearly higher than the advanced rank, he wasn't ever able to progress into the saint rank or above because he didn't fully understand what he was doing. If he did, then he wouldn't have used such vague terms to try and explain it to Rudeus. Now, for a sword king like Ghislaine, the level of discipline, training, and understanding required to get there makes her much better of a teacher than Paul could ever be. There's a certain obsession and commitment to the art of battle that anyone at her level needs to possess something most people simply don't have. As a result, it's very rare to ever come across someone who's a king-level swordsman or higher. In fact, we actually learn in the side story Jobless Oblige that no school has more than five people at the god or emperor ranks combined. The king rank is a bit more common, but even that still only ranges from about 1 to 50 people depending on the school. Because the school itself determines how people progress into these ranks, there's a finite limit on how many kings, emperors, and gods there can be. So, as of where we are right now in the anime, Ghislaine is actually the only known Sword King in the entire world, which makes you wonder how exactly someone like her ended up in service for such a minor noble like Philip. That, however, is a story for a different day. Now, one last thing to note about each of the Sword Styles are that their fundamental techniques are well known across the world. 
Anyone who's remotely interested in the sword styles and their ways of combat will undoubtedly be familiar with the names of its core techniques and what they do. While this is somewhat helpful in developing a counter, there's only one true way to actually see if that counter would work or not, and that's by practicing it against a saint-level practitioner who's capable of using those techniques. But as we now know, given the rarity of saint-level swordsmen and above, finding someone like that would be extremely difficult. Okay, now that you know the fundamentals and a general overview, let's start things off with the most common and strongest school of the sword god style, an approach to combat that's based on the philosophy of attacking first. For anyone who's a student of this school, the general idea is to kill your opponent before they can even draw their sword. It's an offensive style that's heavily focused on the core aspects of speed and aggression, much to the point that defense and counterattacks are barely even trained. That's not to say they don't know how to parry, but more often than not they'll be on the offensive. So parrying and countering isn't something that's really needed if the Sword God style is implemented properly. But anyway, with such a straightforward outlook on swordplay, it makes sense then that the Sword God style has developed into the one with the least amount of core techniques. The first is the unnamed technique that Paul used to slice the boulder. It's also what I assume Eris had used to cut the red hooded cobra in half. The next is the Long Sword of Silence, but this is pretty much a downgraded version of the Saint level technique above it. It's an advanced technique that creates a silent strike faster than the speed of sound, a move that's typically used as training wheels for the ultimate sword god technique called the Long Sword of Light. Now, not only is this the move that determines if you're worthy of the Saint rank, but it's also what every sword god swordsman strives to accomplish. It's the epitome of the entire sword god style as a whole a fearsome technique that single-handedly made this style the strongest out of all the others. As for what it does, well, we've already seen a perfect example of it from Glane's brief showcase in the anime. The sword is held steady with both hands on it, then every bit of possible force is applied to one single swing. If done right, the end result is a practically inevasible slash whose tip reaches the speed of light, thus the reason for the optical aberrations when Glane did it herself. I did a little bit of extra research myself, and what we saw was an actual scientific phenomenon that happens when photons appear to come from all directions. It's a visual anomaly that produces this fisheye effect until it tunnels out to nothing. Now, it's not actually possible for any physical object to move at the speed of light, but if it was and we were able to perceive it, then hypothetically this could be part of what we would see. It just goes to show the level of thought and detail being put into some of these scenes. In any case, as you'd expect from an attack that moves at the speed of light, the power produced by it is enough to cut a heavy armored enemy right in half. And while it is damn near impossible to defend against, there does actually exist a technique whose purpose is to counter it, the fourth and final sword god technique known as light reversal. With this being the only known countermeasure in the world, it makes sense then that timing and reaction speed would be everything. It's a move in which right before the enemy's sword of light reaches its maximum velocity, that's when the person facing it would use their own Sword of Light to cut off their wrists. So, what this is is really just Sword of Light but used more optimally. But yeah, those are the four known techniques that make up the Sword God style. Any person who makes it to the Saint rank or above will undoubtedly be proficient in every single one of them. What's interesting to note though is that even if you did master every technique, that still wouldn't be enough to successfully climb the ranks. You see, when it comes to progression within the Sword God style, the one who determines your ascension is the Sword God himself. Only he can decide who is worthy to ascend beyond the rank of Saint, a process that typically involves both a physical test and a theoretical one. The reason why this is is because titles and rank can be both very meaningful and deceptive at the same time. Sure, someone can reach the rank of Saint by mastering the techniques, but if they'd never been in a real fight before then how strong were they really? I'm sure someone like Paul could easily beat a Sword Saint who'd never tasted real combat before. Plus, even if someone wasn't able to master the techniques to become a saint, there's certainly other ways to prove their mastery with the sword. That's why the sword god makes sure to test any individual who wants to rise above. He wants to make sure that they themselves understand what true strength is, not just some fake strength that's hidden behind an undeserved title and powerful techniques. That said, any title that is granted by the sword god himself is one that actually does carry quite a bit of meaning to it so much so that anyone who makes it to the level of king is automatically awarded one of seven magical swords as a testament to their power. It's the physical representation of their mastery of the sword god style. So, when Ghislaine had faced off with Almonfi in episode 8, 
The reason she raised her sword like the way she did was because that was her proof that she was a sword king. She was showing him that this was in fact one of the seven magical swords. Now, as for what it takes to become the sword god, well, it's pretty much like Afro Samurai in the sense that there can only be one. Any person who strives to become the sword god must first travel to the sword sanctum in the northwest corner of the central continent, then challenge the sword god right there to a duel. It doesn't necessarily have to be a duel to the death, but with the sword god being one of the world's seven great powers, it's very unlikely both people are stepping out from it alive. So, with that being the essence of the sword god style, next we have the water god style's more defensive philosophy. A style of swordsmanship that specializes in defense-based techniques like parrying and countering. Their focus is so much centered around the premise of warding off attacks than countering that they're even taught the art of provoking enemies into attacking them first. This was the core of their non-aggressive defense philosophy. It didn't leave very many openings for attack, but a true water god master could counter-strike literally everything and anything. Whether it be swords, projectiles, or even magical attacks, a skilled practitioner of the water god style could defend against all of it, making this the ideal sword style for royal guards and nobles. Where the water god style falls short though is mainly through its inability to attack first. There's zero situations in which a water swordsman can or should be taking the initiative. Only when an attack is clearly seen to be coming can the water god style's techniques showcase its true power. That being the case, the deceptive nature of the north god's tricky and often sudden attacks puts the water god at a significant disadvantage against it. On the other hand, the very clear intent of the sword god to strike swiftly and immediately makes countering it extremely easy. Well, as long as it's not the sword of light anyway. So, with all that said, the Water God style really does stay true to its defensive philosophy. They even choose to wear heavy armor since they know they don't need to move much. But because all they can do is defend, practitioners of this style are also taught various social skills and observational techniques. Not only does this serve to hide their intentions from their opponent, but it also allows them to read their opponent much faster and more efficiently. The general idea being to figure out your opponent's attack before they can even move. You see, for a style that's focused around deflecting and then countering, every fraction of a second matters when it comes to reacting. Just by having a faint idea of what your opponent is going to do next could easily translate into a counter that decides the battle. Of course, there's observational techniques that are magical in nature, but many are also just high perception abilities like reading body language and facial expressions. It's a skill set that when trained to the fullest can make a high level water god practitioner seem like they're reading minds making it extremely difficult to deceive them. Now, the first core technique of the Water God style is its basic counterattack of flow. This is the backbone of the Water God style as a whole, and it's widely considered to be the most important technique in the entire collection. Much like how the Sword of Light is for Sword God users, flow is the signature move that every Water God practitioner strives to accomplish. It's an extremely versatile technique that, once mastered, is said to be able to return any attack imaginable. Well, that is except for you know what. The next core technique is a collection of ultimate abilities known as the Five Secret Arts, a series of confidential moves that stand at the height of what the Water God style has to offer. We don't really know what they do, but we do know that they're extremely hard to master. Just one likely takes copious amounts of time, dedication, and commitment, much like how a Sword King needs to show a passion for the art of battle. An interesting thing to note about these arts is that at least three need to be mastered before you can even think about becoming a water god. It's an observation that leads me to believe that mastering the arts are associated with ascending beyond the saint rank. This is just speculation, but I wouldn't be surprised if mastering one art qualified you as a king, then mastering two made you an emperor. It makes sense given the three required to become a god. As for the saint rank and below, well, that likely only requires mastery of the signature technique of flow. So, climbing to Water Saint isn't entirely difficult, but if you want to go higher, then that's when things start to get a little bit tougher. It requires much more than just a solid understanding of the style's philosophy. Now, the last core technique worth mentioning is yet another ultimate move that goes by the name of Deprivation Sword Kingdom. This is a technique that was crafted by the Water God herself, one that combines the two hardest secret arts together. What it is, is a stationary defensive stance that allows for the reaction of any possible movement in every direction. Kind of like how Brain's attack worked in Overlord. Anything that so much as touched the border of this technique's range would immediately be cut down by a deadly series of slashes. It was a move that covered every potential angle with a fatal counter. But yeah, that's the majority of what the Water God style encompasses. 
If you're a student seeking out knowledge in this area, then your best bet would be the central dojo led by the current water god in the Asura Kingdom. There you can find a large majority of the most well-trained water god knights in the world. Now, last but certainly not least, the North God style brings us to the realm of adaptability. It's an approach to combat that centers around the philosophy of doing whatever is needed to win, resulting in a large portion of it focusing on creativity, improvisation, and trickery. Whether it be taking advantage of one's surroundings, or even dual-wielding a pair of knives instead of a sword, the North God style brings with it the most rich variety out of all of them. It's a style that isn't overly reliant on a single killer strategy, and that's where it carries value over the other two styles. If you really think about the Water and Sword God's techniques, their single-minded approach to battles severely limits the number of options they have. Like, what would happen to a Sword Saint if they faced an opponent who could easily dodge and block them? Or what happens to a Water Saint when their opponent launches an unconventional sneak attack? There's some very obvious downsides to the clear-cut fighting styles of the other two. When it comes to the North God style's specialization and adaptability, though, there's no telling what your opponent's going to do because every approach to the North God style is taught differently. Depending on where you go to learn it, every institution will teach you something different. Sure, there's probably some general adaptability techniques that are taught across the board, but when learning or fighting against this style, it's really just a toss-up. There's no surefire way to tell what you're going to be up against. Of the techniques that we do know, though, there's utility ones like tracking and first aid, high mobility ones like acrobatic dodging or running on all fours, stealth-based ones that can provide concealment or cause confusion, then really just a whole bunch of others regarding the use of their weapons. There's even the one that we saw Gallus use to fight well with a hostage. Yeah, that whole 1v4 situation was actually a North God technique specifically created for using a hostage to gain the advantage. There is also one technique that involves Toki manipulation, but that's something that requires a high amount of skill to master. So that could very well be the signature technique that classifies swordsmen who are beyond the Saint rank. Other than that though, there's not too much else that we know about the North God style. We don't even know much about how people progress through the ranks. Since there isn't a central location where the North God style is taught, the whole school is just completely disorganized. We can, however, speculate a little bit on how it could happen. Since all the North Kings and Emperors have extremely unique styles of fighting, I wouldn't be surprised if promotions were made whenever a North Saint created their own style of fighting. It'd be the perfect judge of whether they understood the style's philosophy of adaptability. In any case, that's pretty much everything we know about the North God style. Due to its extremely high level of versatility, it's the perfect choice for adventurers and mercenaries who are always confronted by unpredictable situations. It's also definitely the most fun to watch. But yeah, that's everything that you need to know about the sword styles. If you enjoyed what you saw, then be sure to leave a like and let me know in the comments. This was a very lengthy video to make even with Sictor helping with the research. So a huge thanks to him for lending me his knowledge. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!